Hey everyone, this is Hydra Hut, and this is Factory by Elgo. So, um, I wrote down what this guy's real name is on a sticky note, and I just realized I forgot my sticky note. So it's, um, Yanis Elo. Elosi, Eloise, Elgosi, Yanis Elgosi. He's a, uh, a Frenchman. He's from Paris. And he actually wrote this in 2007. Um, this has just been basically reprinted by Factory, translated by Mark Bur Bourbon Crook. I don't know why Elgo didn't translate it. I'm guessing that he wrote this. Um, the company he wrote it for, Titan, probably purchased, so they had the the intellectual property that is factory, and so they had somebody else translate it. <clears throat> the reason I say I don't know why they didn't have um, Elgo do it is because he speaks perfectly good English. Um, so he's from Paris, France. He grew up there. He went to a um, an art school there for animation, and then he moved to California where he worked on um, actually a lot of very popular animation. He worked on uh, Titan AE. He uh, worked on Futurama. And quite a few other things. And he's also done some writing for uh, Marvel. Now these guys. And a few others. Um, the main reason I got this is because of this cover. I mean, it's cool looking. But but this right here. This right here. This is a Bisley cover. So if you're not familiar with Simon Bisley, then you need to read more Lobo. Because it's the greatest series ever. Simon Bisley and... Uh, Val Semeckis are probably the two most, two of the most well-known Lobo artists. Um, I would say more people probably know Bisley for his Lobo than for anything else. Uh, he kind of, kind of redefined the character. I mean, if you look at the original um, Grant Giffen version, Semeckis didn't, ch or um, Bisley didn't change much. He just added a lot of small details that really brought the character together. Plus, his art is fantastic. Um, I was actually hoping he was going to be doing some more than just a cover for this, but uh, even it's just the cover, that was really all the reason I needed to buy it. <laughs> Let's talk about the cover, though. Does it actually uh, give you any idea of what's going on in the in the book? Kind of. There is a little monkey. Doesn't look anything like this. I don't know what this uh, nasty, thorny arm is. Maybe one of the trees that's in this. Uh, and there are guys that dress similar to this due to the type of area they're in. So what Factory is actually about is kind of a post-apocalyptic world, um, like most sci-fi, of course. Uh, everybody is extremely impoverished. Um, you learn that there's no mammals anymore other than humans. Um, we're basically following a couple different groups of people. The The main bad guy so far is this guy named Lord Guko, who is um, some sort of baron or lord who basically doles out food to all the impoverished people in these certain camps. So, story starts off with this uh, very, very classic style, gritty art that you've probably noticed I'm a big fan of. <laughs> um, this is a precog, and apparently he's having some issues. He ends up uh, basically exploding out of his little case thing. They're worried that he's going to die. Well, they know he's going to die because he's no longer in his amniotic fluid. And he's exposed. They, they uh, go to help him, but they're warned by the other guys there that you can't get too close. His cerebral cortex has a, a big field around it that could actually hurt you uh, <clears throat> because of his precognitive abilities. But as he is starting to die, he gives one last, um, one last prophecy, and he warns everybody of a pig man who is coming, and they must stop him. Afterwards, they say uh, the guys that have basically watched him die are like a man pig. That's crazy. His mutations must have made him lose his mind. The precog sees all. He must bring his uh, words to Master Guko. Only he can decide. The reason they they think it's impossible that it could be a man pig is because there's no mammals left in the world, as far as they know. So the idea of uh, a pig being around is just inconceivable. Um, this here is Lord Guko. They basically tell him that the precog is dead, 
They need to get a new one. He uh, becomes extremely worried that he's no longer going to have an edge on society. He's worried that the people that he takes care of are going to rebel because that precog was some sense of, uh, of order in the chaos of their society. Uh, it gave them an idea of what was happening. He could have something to turn to to, to ease their, their uh, <laughs> worries. <laughs> <clears throat> we also find out that there's a, an inspector, a food inspector coming. So we learn that um, Guko isn't like the king or lord or anything. He's just a, a, a lordly guy looking over this particular area, which gives us an idea that this is kind of an imperialistic future or maybe a theocracy because they do talk a lot about gods in this. Um, the fact that everybody's starving, of course, reminds me of communism, but I'm pretty sure they're talking about imperialism here. It's just a you know, coincidence that communists starve as well. <clears throat> and then uh, as we, um, after becoming oriented with Lord Guko, we then move on to another um, area of the book where we follow some more of our main characters. And this is where we finally get introduced to this man pig we were worried about. Uh, these two here are ex-philosophers whose brains have slowly deteriorated over time while traveling. Um, this is one of his traveling companions. And this is actually... Uh, I'd say a pretty humorous little scene here where we get some banter back and forth between the pig and the, um, the atrocious looking little dude. Uh, he basically asked the pig man how he became a pig. He says he woke up one day and was like that. And the little guy was like, do you ever think that maybe you've always been a pig? A, uh, a pig being graced with the ability to think and talk is far more positive light than a, a normal person being turned into a pig. <laughs> and then the, uh, the pig guy, a worried proposition. I'll give you that, Obaz. But I've not lost my mind. I still remember who I am. Anyhow, I learned, like you, the only the old wizard Zaito could restore my normal form. And you? And you? What did you do to warrant such a loathsome appearance? Nothing. This is my natural form. But thank you for <laughs> the delicate comment. As they're walking through these woods, um, this random tree picks up one of these ex-philosophers and just eviscerates him. Uh, and that's where we find out that nature is dangerous. And they all flee. Then we jump back to uh, the villages, the impoverished areas. Uh, we see they do have central power, which is interesting. I haven't seen any sort of lights or anything like that. The uh, only thing I've really seen is a factory. <coughs> and here we start seeing the um, basically the servants of Guko handing out food to the impoverished. Uh, they're handing out rotten, nasty filth, basically, and telling the people that they should be thankful that they're getting anything at all because Lord Guko is the only reason they survive. <laughs> we also find out that they're knowingly giving them bad food. Um, and it, it's really setting the scene for just how bad society is right now. And then we immediately move over to Lord Guko, who is feasting on meats, food that doesn't look... Uh, I mean, the art style makes it look pretty gross, but it, it's clearly not rotten or anything like that. And he's bitching that it's uh, the, the times have ruined his appetite, and he can't eat anything else, and he's got to skip dessert, and... We're pretty sure that he's just going to waste all this excess food. We then start talking about the food inspector again that's supposed to be coming. And this is where we learn that they're not supposed to be eating meat. So they have to be very careful about this guy. They also um, don't have the precog to tell him when he's showing up. And they have all new employees at the food inspector's group. So they don't have any inside men that can really help them out. Then we get a little flash scene where the person that I believe is going to be the food inspector is walking through the desert. Um... And immediately back to the uh, <coughs> the impoverished area where we see some of Guko's servants trying to hunt down this man pig. <coughs> Skip a little bit. So once we're back with the pig and Obaz, um, they're basically starving. Uh, the pig is being a very, very disgruntled asshole, basically, because he's hungry. And then that's when they meet this monkey. Um, the monkey makes fun of him and then offers to feed him. And leads him over to a very, very disgusting scene. Um, one of these nutsack trees here bursts out this this little creature. The monkey tells him to go ahead and eat it. It's safe, very nutritious. Um, because they're stupid, they believe him. They munch down on that, that creature. And start going into some gnarly hallucinations. Um, seeing each other as these big, big monsters... Uh, and then the monkey offers to go ahead and fix their problem, but they have to follow them. 
Also, while this is happening, we uh, we get some more stuff with the guy that we assume is the food inspector and find out that he may have some sort of power, but we're not really sure. And then the story ends, leaving us with a lot more questions than answers, um, but a good idea of what's what this world is like and what may be coming. Um, here is the, uh, the Elgo cover. It's just pretty sick looking as well compared to the Bisley. I mean, you like them both, but Bisley's my boy. <clears throat> so anyway, as far as good apocalyptic sci-fi, I would say this is a pretty solid read. From 2007, so if you know French, you can probably go back and read the original. Being that it's 2007, I think it's pretty safe to say that this is going to stay good. Um, 2007 was a little bit before the French turned full, full PC and gave their country away. So, I recommend it. It's by Titan Comics. Check it out, guys. Hail Hydra.